Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to uh, the evaluation of small bowel tumors, detection, and classification. And this will be our third and final part of the story. Now, I left off last time. I kept you in suspense that I was going to speak about lymphoma. Lymphoma is the third most common small bowel malignancy. The, the stomach is the most commonly affected portion of the GI tract, with small bowel being number two. And it's typically found in the distal ileum because it has the most lymphoid tissue. Remember, adenocarcinoma is more proximal. Lymphoma is more distal. Most cases involving the bowel are non-Hodgkin's B-cell lymphoma. T-cell lymphoma has a high association with celiac disease and occurs more commonly in the jejunum. Some of the risk factors for lymphoma, patients with AIDS, IBD, immunosuppression after organ transplantation, patients with lupus, post-chemotherapy, and Epstein-Barr virus. In Western countries, B-cell lymphoma of mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue, so-called malt lymphoma, is the most common subtype of primary small bowel lymphoma. T-cell lymphomas are much less common. Primary small bowel lymphoma is usually B-cell we mentioned, and we mentioned is more common distally. In terms of appearance, small bowel is challenging, small bowel lymphoma that is, is challenging because the appearance is very much like adenocarcinoma can be variable, from an infiltrating lesion to aneurysmal dilatation to single or multiple nodular filling defects to an endoexenteric form with fistulae. Now, small bowel lymphoma can cause obstruction. Here's a patient with dilated small bowel loops. We track it downward and we see the transition is at the level of the distal ileum and the level of the cecum. And there's a soft tissue mass present there. And when we look carefully, you can see the mass. Maybe you think it's an adenocarcinoma of the cecum growing into the small bowel. But you know, usually it's small bowel growing into the patient's colon. And that appearance there is very good for lymphoma. This was a B-cell lymphoma involving terminal ileum extending into the patient's cecum. Very nicely shown there and there. In this example, again, some more images. This makes the point that small bowel lymphoma can cause obstruction. It's not always the case. Small bowel lymphoma often can be very exophytic, as I mentioned, and in those cases, even large tumors, very much the same story with just tumors, when things grow exophytic, they typically do not obstruct bowel. Here's that same patient showing you the cinematic rendering with the tumor infiltration. Now, this is a patient with B-cell lymphoma presented with chest pain. You see there's a mass involving the left atrium encasing the left atrium. And then you say, what is it? Is it an angiosarcoma? Could it be lymphoma? Could it be metastasis? Then when you scan the patient's abdomen, you found a large mass in the right lower quadrant. It was ulcerating. This is a good example of lymphoma involving small bowel and involving the heart. Very nicely shown there. And here it is in the coronal view. Lymphomas, and in, as in this case, can be ulcerating. One of the concerns with lymphoma, particularly in regard to chemotherapy when lesions are large, is that tumors can involute quickly and necrose and perforate. So you have to be very careful when they do therapy. Sometimes these B-cell lymphomas, particularly in HIV patients, are humongous. Here's a mass infiltrating almost the left half of the abdomen. It's hard to say what this is. You know it's a big sarcoma or something because it's involving the bowel, maybe involving the stomach. You kind of lose all the planes. This was small bowel lymphoma. Here it is on the coronal view, very nicely seeing the large bulky tumor and the extensive ulceration present. Here it is on the coronal view with encasement also of the SMA and encasement of the SMV. Another example, lymphoma can involve the mesenteric vessels, so-called so sandwich sign. Here's a bulky lesion encasing the artery and vein, sitting right in the middle. There it is on the coronal view. You see how it infiltrates? One of the things about small bowel lymphoma in the mesentery and in the bowel itself, it can extend almost like infiltration. It gets bulky and often doesn't obstruct. That's one of the things that can be very helpful in the differential diagnosis. And here's the same case using volume rendering on the venous phase imaging. Here it is on the cinematic, that sandwich sign, the mass encasing the mesenteric vessels, very classic for lymphoma. And here's the bulky mass sitting very nicely right here.
Another example. Look at this case. You see a little bit of ascites, some mildly dilated bowel, but you also see bulky nodes in the right periodic region. We scan further downward. Look at that large bulky tumor involving the terminal ilium extending to the cecum. Again, you can think about adenocarcinoma, but it's kind of bulky. You can think about just tumor, but that's typically exophytic, not so infiltrative. You can think about METs like melanoma. That would be a good thought. But this is with the large bulky nodes and the infiltration lymphoma. Lymphoma infiltrating the ileum, extending into the patient's cecum with large periodic and pelvic adenopathy. Just a beautiful example of lymphoma. And again, this is a good example of where the positive contrast works very nicely. You see the infiltration of the wall of the bowel. You can see the lumen and the ulceration present. Now, one of the things with lymphoma, it can cause intersusceptions. Essentially, every mass in the small bowel can intercept, be it benign, like a lyomyoma or lipoma, or metastasis or adenocarcinoma or carcinoid. When you have multiple intersusceptions, then you're thinking about lymphoma. Here is multiple intersusceptions in this patient. There's also involvement of the patient's right kidney. Now, neoplasms account for about 70% of intersusceptions in adults. Adult intersusception of the small bowel is usually caused by benign lesions, where intersusceptions of the large bowel are usually malignant lesions. Remember those incidental intersusceptions in the patient's jejunum. Adenocarcinoma is the most common pathology of small bowel intersusceptions, but lymphoma, sarcomas, and METs can all do the same thing as well. And they also occur in other tumors like melanoma, lung cancer, and breast cancer. Here's a nice example of intersusception in the right lower quadrant. There are, in fact, multiple intersusceptions. This was metastatic melanoma. So I'm covering two points here. One is that intersusception can occur with small bowel tumors, benign and malignant, and there can be overlap between the appearances of the two. I'm also showing you how when you think about small bowel tumors, don't forget about metastatic disease. METs are becoming more common as a cause of small bowel tumors, particularly melanoma. is a wonderful example showing you the mass and showing you the patient's intersusception. Again, nicely shown here as well. Now, Poots Jaeger is a patient with Poots Jaeger syndrome, had a polyp, and you can see the intersusception. A long, beautiful example of intersusception. Here's the fat being pulled in. Here's the intersusception right here. So, again, two very classic axial and coronal views. Very important to be able to recognize it. Here it is on 3D, where you can see the vessels are being drawn in, the vessels off the SMA. Now, I mentioned before about capsule endoscopy. 50,000 images in eight hours. It makes CT seem like uh, hardly any images. Original articles, it was incredible. But now, you know, there's a lot of challenges. You can cause, it could be obstruction. If you have a, a tumor present or a stricture, the camera's going to get obstructed. It is useful in patients with GI bleeding, particularly when GI bleeding, uh, you can't find the cause on CT. Of course, even endoscopy can miss lesions due to improper bowel prep rapid transit time, or the presence of blood. And of course, capsule retention is a disaster. I read this case in a patient with Merkel cell tumor as recurrent Merkel cell large mass obstructing the patient's small bowel. For whatever reason, they gave the patient a camera. I don't know why, but showed, I'm sure it showed what we found. But look, the camera is obstructed by the metastasis. So you can't do a camera study without a CT showing no strictures, mass, or bowel obstruction. If not, you can run into really severe problems because there's only one way the capsule comes out, and that's going to be via surgery. And again, that's the look of the capsule. Don't assume that's retained barium and artifact. People often make that assumption. You can see the transistors on the topogram a little bit better. Now, a small bowel mass in a patient with a known malignancy is likely a MET. The most common malignancy involving the small bowel is metastatic. Small bowel mets are characterized by means of spread, intraperitoneal seeding, hematogenous spread, or local extension. And that was an article we wrote like a lifetime ago. Julie Buckley, I think she's still in Palo Alto. Mets to the small bowel sites. Melanoma is seemingly number one these days, but lung cancer, carcinoid, ovary, and colon. But also when you think about direct extension, you would have to mention pancreatic cancer.
Now I mentioned there's three methods of spread, so let's cover each of them. When you talk about intraperitoneal seeding, that's gonna be things like ovarian cancer or mucinous tumors of the appendix or colon, but ovarian cancer is the poster child. When you think about hematogenous mets, then you think about lung cancer and breast and melanoma and renal cell. And direct extension, typically it's pancreatic cancer. Think about pancreatic cancer involving the duodenum. Second portion when there's a head tumor or the area by the ligament of trites where there's a tumor of the distal body or tail. In this article by Megan Lee, she made the point, the average time from diagnosis of primary malignancy or remission to the time of detection of MET was over seven years. So one of the things this article says very carefully is small bowel METs often occur late. You're not really thinking about them. That's one of the challenges. Small bowel METs from renal cell occur at least 10 years later. The same thing is true with METs to pancreas from renal cell. So you need to be very careful when you do routine oncology follow-ups. Nothing is ever routine. You want to look at the small bowel very carefully. Mess of the small bowel often occur many years after the initial diagnosis of the primary malignancy or entering remission and may be symptomatic or may be asymptomatic. Good quote, as oncology patients undergo numerous surveillance scans and improved therapies allow for longer survival, detection of these masses at a small size can facilitate elective resection to avert urgent surgical intervention. Very well said, Megan. And again, a very important article because we are seeing more metastasis now. And I'll let you read the rest of that in the article. Couple examples, patient with synovial sarcoma, widespread liver mets. Look at the patient's dilated small bowel and you see the cause. There's an intersusception right in the patient's right lower quadrant. Very nicely shown. There are also multiple one centimeter enhancing lesions in the small bowel. All of these are metastatic foci, nicely shown. Here's a patient with renal cell carcinoma, routine follow-up. There's a one centimeter enhancing lesion in the region of the fourth portion of the duodenum, very nicely shown right there, okay? Or in this case, there's another enhancing lesion in the patient's ileum to the left of midline, again, this could be in the right patient, a carcinoid, could be a gist tumor, but in a patient with renal cell carcinoma in the past, you gotta assume it's more likely to be metastatic from renal cell carcinoma. At times it can be tricky to see. Here we're showing you volume rendering in MIP, and because the lesion is vascular, which is very good for renal cell, it really stands out very nicely. Again, the point being, you may have to work to be able to make the diagnosis. And here it is as you go from arterial to venous phase and the lesion washes out. Another example, melanoma with intussusception. You can see the intussusception in the left upper quadrant. You see it very nicely on the coronal view as well, that crescent. You see it very nicely on the cinematic view. Or this patient, again, we often don't think about METs in this scenario. This patient was actually sent to pancreatic multidisciplinary conference. Patient presented with jaundice, there's multiple intrahepatic duct dilatation and there's a large mass. Now I have to admit, this does not look like pancreatic adenocarcinoma, even though there's duct dilatation. I would have thought more like a GIST tumor perhaps, or maybe a neuroendocrine tumor, but it should be more vascular. But this was an adenocarcinoma. I wasn't sure what this was. I favored it just to be honest. This was biopsy. This was metastatic melanoma. I've now seen about four cases like this. Patients presenting with suspected pancreatic masses that have metastatic melanoma to duodenum, presenting as a large mass. Now melanoma is becoming more common. Often its presentation is these large small bowel tumors. Here's another example, same case. Again, you would think about just tumor, you'd think about many different things. It doesn't look like pancreatic adenocarcinoma, particularly when you have the rest of the scans which show the pancreas looking normal. This was metastatic melanoma to the duodenum. Just a very large tumor, inhomogeneous areas of enhancement and areas of necrosis. And here it is very nicely shown on the patient's um, cinematic rendering, just really nicely accentuating the necrosis in the patient's tumor. Sometimes the lesions are subtle. Look at this case, look at the duodenum. Do you see anything? Well, if you look really, really carefully, there's a one centimeter lesion posterior wall. You see it, look harder, 
but it's easier to see when you go to the coronal. There's the lesion. It's a bit over a centimeter. It's vascular. That was metastatic disease in the patient's duodenum. Now, if you would have said a duodenal carcinoma, or a duodenal adenal gist, you might have been right. But you got to think about METs, especially if the patient's had a prior primary. And here it's shown very nicely on the patient's MIP imaging as well. Again, another example, cinematic rendering really makes that melanoma stand out in the second portion. Again, we are looking at this, and it does seem to be promising. So we will see what happens over the coming years. And just a few more images showing you that because when I get a good case, I like to shoot images and share them with you. But just some very nice examples of the range of appearances of that case. Breast cancer, we talk about breast to stomach, linitis plastica. Also the small bowel, this patient had nausea and vomiting, thickening of the bowel, looks like a primary adenocarcinoma. You see the length of the lesion on the coronal view, really nicely shown, ulceration, I would have said adenocarcinoma, maybe lymphoma. This was metastatic breast cancer, okay? So breast cancer, stomach or small bowel, can go to ureters, can go to bladder, can go to kidney. Um, one of the challenges about metastatic breast cancer. Another example, this patient presented with gastric outlet obstruction. You see the stomach's distended, you see the duodenum's distended, then you see a mass. And the mass is actually arising from the tail of the pancreas and growing to the fourth portion of the duodenum, proximal jejunum, at the ligament of trites. So again, pancreatic cancers, remember I said direct extension of bowel, we always think about the duodenum proximally, but it can be distally with tail or body lesions involving either the distal duodenum by ligament of trites or proximal jejunum. And you can see very nicely showing that on the coronal views and showing it on the coronal volume rendering, as well as the coronal cinematic rendering, nicely shown there, the necrosis, the different intensity between that necrosis and fluid in the stomach or duodenum. So concluding then, I've gone through a lot of information showing you how dedicated CT is so good at detecting small bowel tumors even when they're small. I've showed you the importance of lesion detection, obviously, and I've showed you about differential diagnosis, to be frank, if you can't find the lesion, you can't give a differential diagnosis. So the most important thing, the most important message is protocol using post-processing multiplanar 3D to detect the lesion. And then I've also shown you, once you've seen the lesion, how you can be very specific in terms of differential diagnosis. So that ends my three-part adventure on small bowel tumors. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. With that, have a great day. This is Elliot Fishman, signing out. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.